Welcome back to the Saints and Alumni Show right here on WBCR 88.3 The Saint. I'm your host this week, Brandon Murphy, class of 2017 from the Office of Alumni Engagement. And this week I'm joined by Yannick Ambrose, class of 2010, founder of Assembly Line Entertainment and film producer whose movie in the summer recently won the Grand Jury Prize at the Sundance Film Festival. A reminder to everyone listening to us that there are a few ways to listen to the Saints and Alumni Show, a bi-weekly podcast highlighting members of our Siena Saints. You can listen on WBCR 88.3 The Saint, Apple and Spotify, iHeartRadio, and subscribe to the Siena Alumni YouTube channel to check out the complete selection of shows. Yannick, thanks so much for taking the time to sit down with the Siena community today uh, to share your Siena story, but even more importantly, your, your career inside of the film industry. You know, I can honestly say this is the first guest that we've had on the podcast in two and a half years that actually has this as a career path. So officially welcome, your first time on the show. How are you doing today? Good, man. I, I really appreciate you uh, having me on. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. And we have a lot to unpack today, um, but before we get to present day and the Sundance Film Festival uh, and the work you're doing with the various projects, our listeners always like to begin to, to get a picture painted for them on how our guests ended up at Siena. So I want to you know, take the clock backs a little bit and, and give our listeners a chance to understand for you, Yannick, what the college search process was like, um, what you liked about Siena, and ultimately why you wanted to attend yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, to be totally honest, I didn't have uh, I, I probably wasn't the best uh, uh, student in high school, but I was uh, at least aimed to uh, go to Siena. I have heard I always heard a lot of great things. Um, and so uh, I even though I wasn't I didn't get into too many of my colleges, <laughs> I was very pumped to get into Siena. My 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 bet one of my best friends in high school, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mike uh, was was went to high school with he he and I both went there together. Um, it was a great experience. Obviously, like I started with marketing management, and uh, I started to kind of get a passion in economics, and uh, and yeah, and uh, it, it was a it, they obviously I always knew Sienna had a great business school, and even though that I wanted to always do film, um, I always wanted to kind of understand business because I kind of understood that the movie industry is a very much about money and is very much a business. It's very much an industry. So uh, it was a really good fit, I think, to kind of have that knowledge before getting into the actual like art, artistry of filmmaking and all that kind of stuff. And you talked a little bit about, you know, diving into marketing management and the school of business. And, and because at the time that, that you were looking at school, Siena didn't have this uh, theater track that we do now. And, and for those listening that maybe don't know, in, in August of 2023, uh, Siena announced a, a brand new theater major um, with specific tracks in design, technology, management, and performance. And all of those skill sets can be used outside of Siena. For you, Yana, you had a little bit of a different approach where you were the marketing management and school of business. But how do you feel like those skills that you gained inside the classroom have translated into the business that you have now that we'll touch upon in a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And I should clarify too. It's like, it, I think because Sienna didn't have that big of an arts program when I was going to, when I was applying to colleges, like there's like the NYU, the UCLA type schools for film. That's what I kind of meant is like Sienna had such a great liberal arts in general business program. But for me, there was there was just less schools that had those types of programs so it was like an odd thing to go to Siena a little bit but to piggyback off what you're saying yeah all this stuff I mean learning finance learning uh economics doing a few years in management like I said I did switch majors all that stuff was obviously just imperative because like I like I said at the end of the day the film industry is an industry so having kind of a keen understanding of investing uh financing uh, accounting was probably probably one of my weakest links but uh, <laughs> th those types of things uh are all intertwined into making a movie because like people always say movies are like the most expensive paintbrush because with painting or music you can always kind of just like make your art even with writing to some degree uh which is why i probably started out writing so much but with movies it's a multi even a low budget movie 
is a million dollars, right? That's a considered an ultra, ultra, literally in the uh, union, you know, uh, brackets is considered ultra low is like a mil is like under $2 million. So movies can go up to a hundred to $200 million budgets. So naturally having that business uh, skill set from Sienna was, uh, was, you know, vital to, especially it's starting my own company, but that's kind of almost, you know, even secondarily, but even just making a movie on its own requires so much business sav uh, savviness. So. And I, I came into Sienna, I was an undeclared business and, and I struggled grandly with, with business. I went to tutoring every single night and I scraped by with the B minus. Like it is, it was very challenging, but those skill sets that people gained here are so valuable down the line. And I want to pivot the discussion now a little bit into how you, how you gained some interest into film and into writing, because we, as we know now, there wasn't a specific track at Sienna, but you had this really interesting story of just taking it upon yourself and and immersing yourself in the different resources that Sienna has to offer to kind of get your feet wet in the industry. Can you talk a little bit about kind of roaming the library and and, and immersing yourself? Yeah, in that? yeah, hundred percent. I mean, to be totally honest, like at Sienna, like especially the first couple of years, I had to go to you know Peter, Peter Ellard's office, and he had to yell at me about my grades because I got a lot of D's and C's. <laughs> but um, but you know, uh, I I would say a lot of that has to do with the fact that I was just. I wouldn't say just hanging out, but I was going, like you said, roaming through the libraries, finding the Criterion Collection DVDs, hanging out in my dorm room till five o'clock in the morning and watching movies. So I kind of did a bifurcation of like, okay, well, I'm gonna just make sure I graduate <laughs> and get uh, and go to go to class, and then also on the side, basically have my own little film school where I was writing and I was watching a lot of movies and I would bother my friends to watch all these like weird fifties Hitchcock movies and all that. <laughs> so like, and then of course, over time, I, I, because I switched majors, I was able to kind of find more interest and realize that, oh, I can kind of mine what I'm doing at Sienna for not only just uh, knowledge to make a start a business and get in the film industry, but also for even content to write about. So like, uh, you know, I've written several scripts about that are very historical that are, you know, I'm a, I'm a writer for hire in many cases. And I'll write about biopics about famous people in history, Theodore Roosevelt or Francis Perkins or all these people. And some of that, just the, the ability to, to even understand how to do research as a writer was obviously informed when you go to a liberal arts school, you're mm -hmm. taught how to properly research a film, not just going, or I'm sorry, research, research a subject, I should say not just going on Google, like, you know, with, uh, I'm sure a lot of other writers do if they don't have that kind of education. So that obviously, or that also was really helpful other than just the business stuff was just that general liberal arts uh, kind of uh, knowledge. I should say. And we've got just about six minutes left in the first segment today. And you saw it name dropping here and there. And, and Dr. Peter, Peter Ellard is a throwback name at Siena. He was here when I was a student uh, in 2013. Um, and, and the first one that I want to talk about when, when we look at professors and community members uh, is, is Dr. Trees for you. Because you mentioned to me that, that he had a positive role with your time at Siena. Uh, why was that for you, Yannick? And, and can you let our listeners know that? Yeah, he, I mean, I think because I started to get more into economics, and like I said, I think that really helped me have, with things in the film industry, so just, just to make sure it's tied together. But no, uh, Dr. Trees was just really, uh, really, one, he was just really smart. I feel like, two, he was also just very, uh, like, cool. Like, you can just talk to him. Like, I mean, I, 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 he, we hung, he hung out, you know, uh, at our townhouse once, uh, you know, we were parts like, so it's just they had that just ability to just kind of hang out with a professor and talk to him about uh, geopolitics or politics or the current what's going on with the economy right now, other than just what's in the textbook was uh, was was is important. You know, I mean, that's just that that makes the difference. That's why I, might, I remember him and maybe not others. You know what I mean? And it's it's important because at Siena, you know, the average class size is right around 18 per professor. Uh, and you can build those close relationships. And and the second professor that we want to highlight kind of helps tie in our discussion into, into segment two today. And that's Professor uh, Brian Maspin. Can you talk a little bit about who he is and, and how you got a relationship with him at Siena? Yeah, uh, Maspin was uh, was awesome. I mean, he, he this was very much more on a literal sense than um, than Trees because he was specifically teaching art and specifically film, right? So I think just... What helped was with he remember when he would play movies from like the 40s and 30s and 50s 
and I would, because like I said, I was hanging out in my dorm room and watching all these movies and watching them in high school and as a kid, he was just kind of emphasizing like, hey, it's not normal that you know so much about movies, right? So like just kind of being like, hey, this is abnormal in a good way that you know this much about movies at your age. And I already kind of knew I wanted to get in the film industry. So I wasn't kind of sitting there saying, oh, I'm not saying like it was like, like kind of a light bulb went off in my head. But that really reinforced the idea of being like, hey, what you're doing is different. So it just reinforced the idea of like, I am going to just go down that different path, no matter how weird it seems. Because I didn't tell even a lot of people at the time. I mean, people know I like movies, but I always knew since I was in high school that I was going to go out to LA and do this. But I didn't tell many people because it just sounds odd. So he was just very encouraging. Um, he also was just like, you know, would look at some of my like very early, like just editing with pictures and mm -hmm. music. And he was just really encouraging and was like, you know, the, the, the whole thing, like, oh yeah, you're good at this, et cetera, which is all you need sometimes, you know? And we've got just under two minutes left in the first segment today. And I got one final question for you. And it kind of really starts to make the picture a little bit clearer in the, in the second segment today. And that's life after Sienna. You know, you talk about you wanting to be in the film industry and the people, you know, that they want to be lawyers, they go to pre-law uh, for people that want to be doctors, they go to med school. Kind of what happened for you next at Sienna? Did you stay in Albany or did you move somewhere else? No, I, I, as soon as it was over, I think I stayed in Albany for a couple months. Uh, and then I went to New York Film Academy, which is a conservatory school. It's not really like an NYU or a UCLA. It is uh, more of a um, conservatory. So I, I went there to study producing. So once again, kind of doubling down on the idea of understanding the business and producing so I can write and direct. So I kind of just kept taking that to the, I guess, to an extreme. So I would then start my company there. Um, so that was kind of the immediate, uh, after aftermath of Sienna was, I just went right away and started the company when I was 22, the same one I have now. So like, that was my, just immediately going out to LA, I would say is the, is the thing. And when we come back after, uh, the end of the first segment, we'll talk about his, some of his first jobs out in LA, uh, get into greater detail about his company, assembly line entertainment and highlight some of the work that he is doing in the film industry. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back here on the Saints and Alumni Show. Welcome back to the Saints and Alumni Show right here on WVCR, 88.3 The Saint. I'm your host this week, Brandon Murphy, class of 2017, from the Office of Alumni Engagement. And this week, I'm joined by Yannick Ambrose, class of 2010, and founder of Assembly Line Entertainment and film producer, whose movie, In the Summers, recently won the Grand Jury Prize, the Sundance Film Festival. So we just wrapped up talking about your Siena experience, uh, talking about the Film Academy, and then moving out to LA. And I want to begin the conversation in segment two now, talking about some of those first jobs out there before you started your company specifically. Kind of what what were you working on? How did you get your foot in the door? And how, how did you kind of make connections out there? Yeah, I, I moved there. I didn't really know anybody. Uh, I After film school, uh, I, which was only a year and a half as an accelerator program, I didn't have any work so I worked at the New York Film Academy uh as like a on the desk like helping the school I got fired because I was starting my I, I was basically running my new company out of the out of the school so that was good though because then it kind of pushed me to start really kicking it up a notch so I basically what I did was I would uh make short docs and sh experimental films avant-garde films just like play them at festivals um I would I would do once again, do that bifurcation of writing and directing, always writing, 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 but then directing little things. And then the other side, I would work on the business and producing. So as my little films were getting a little bit bigger, like, and then I did a feature doc called Imminent Threat, which was like a, a doc about the war on terror and how it impacts civil liberties. My movies were getting a little bit bigger. And then my on the other side, my producing was getting bigger because I would start using what I learned at Siena to some degree about financing and basically connecting financiers with projects. So one of those projects was a movie called 10,000 Saints with Ethan Hawke and uh, Haley Steinfeld. And that was like in 2015. So I secured money. So I ended up being like a co-producer on a movie at Sundance when I was really young. So that obviously helped not only my company, but it helped my name a little bit as a writer director. So I, I kind of just grew both these plans. So they would eventually coalesce into one, right? And uh, so those first few jobs, I would say, other than, you know, the random PA work I had to do and just bullshit uh, or, uh, you know, just cheap, cheap work where I wouldn't get paid too much. 
was really just always doubling down on my on on my company um and then after that movie at Sundance I was able to kind of work with investors more and then I had a movie at at uh, Toronto Toronto Film Festival a movie with like Marissa Tomei and Liam Schreiber and then uh, I was eventually able to make my first feature film, which is a very crazy psychedelic uh, drug movie that I wrote and directed uh, that uh, James Cromwell, who some of you might know uh, uh, as the farmer in Babe, or he's the uh, Ellen on Succession. He produced that. So yeah, those was that was kind of like my first five, six years out in uh, out in LA. And you've uh, you've answered a lot of big picture themes here. It's like you've been on the podcast before and, and you sneak peeked at a few different topics that we're going to get to. Uh, the, the next one, I want to talk a little bit about kind of, you know, what your company does specifically, because I'm curious and our listeners might be too, is like, do do people come to you and say, we need X, Y, and Z, or are you contracted out by a bigger industry to do X, Y, and Z? Kind of what are, what is the layout of your company and, and the day-to-day -day business? Well, so I, I, I usually come up with the ideas. So like, I'll, since I'm a writer, I, I it's, well, once again, a business term, a vertical integration, right? So like, uh, that I learned at Sienna. So yeah, you'd I basically would write or at least uh, start an infancy of an idea and then work with other writers and just produce various projects. Now, some of it, like I mentioned, is connecting money to bigger projects because that helps my brand. So like, I'll do that as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's always the focus is more on my own writing and directing career um, as and producing career, as opposed to just kind of like ser servicing work. I did servicing work. I serviced work more when I was when I started the company, but we rarely we I don't do that at all anymore. Now, what I have is something called a development deal. So like I have a development deal with Exile Content Studio, which is owned by Candle Media um, and uh what a development deal is, is all basically they pay me to write screenplays and produce. So that's one of the projects I did under my development deal was in the summers. Uh, but yeah, so I'll now it's like for my company, I basically get I get contracts with companies that I'll work for for a set amount of years or a set amount of films per, uh, per year or per contract. Um, so that's kind of how it how it how it works now. And before we dive into, uh, I want to talk about imminent threat. I want to talk about in the summers, and I want to talk about the documentary uh, "Ukrainians in Exile." Uh, you, you've thrown around a few different terms that that's that's in the film industry, such as a featured film, a short film. Uh, can you talk a little bit about like what is the difference between the styles of films that your company produces? Yeah, um, I would say like uh, earlier on, like short films, because I was just in my early twenties, and you just couldn't raise the money for a feature a, a short film is just basically under 45 minutes um they're typically the films that are short films that have more merit or short docs a lot of docs that are high, of high prominence are still short um i don't know if you like watch the oscars they have best short documentary yeah, yeah. Like that so uh but what i mainly mainly work in is feature film so feature film just means that it's a full-length movie it's that it's like over an hour right um and that's basically it um the and then there's obviously doc and narrative film narrative film just means that there's actors and it's make pretend and so let's talk about a little bit about imminent threat now you talked in your in your previous answer that it was the one of the first projects that you worked on kind of what is imminent threat about and and what was uh, maybe some of the highs and lows or things that you learned your first time producing? Yeah, I mean, I was I was like 24, I think, when I made it. So I don't know what I mean. I, I, I really just used a lot of it was a feature blank documentary about uh, the war on terror and how it impacts civil liberties. Uh, I would probably redo a lot of it now. But uh, no, it was just a very low budget documentary that was a feature length film that um, uh, I was fortunate to get out there and, and, uh, and you know, it played at festivals and. It's kind of part of a little slew of docs that are about the invasion of Iraq, NSA uh, spying and, and uh, you know, domestic surveillance and all that kind of stuff. These are all themes I still work with today, just more narrative films. Um, so it was obviously beneficial, like one movie that I'm working on with Exiles, it's called War Game. And it's about the largest war game in U.S. history that was used to justify the invasion of Iraq uh, about General Paul Van Riper. So we're... I wrote that as a screenplay, like a $12 million budget narrative film. So a lot of what I did at Imminent Threat, it was 
at least some of that knowledge is used in that film. So it's kind of one of those things like nothing's done in vain. So though, even though it was small, it was, uh, but yeah, it was really just kind of my first feature film. Uh, and I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't have a lot of money. So it was just, just getting, getting it made. It was really important. And we've got just about six minutes left in, in today's show. And we want to talk about in the summers, you creating an exile and, and the overall production of a film. So I want to talk next about in the summers, kind of what was that about and what is the Sundance Film Festival and, and how did how did that get nominated to, to be in that? Yeah, so in the summers uh, was a project I was producing for in my development deal with Exile Content Studio. Um, and it's a uh, a movie about a father and his two daughters that spread out over three different summers uh, as they grow older, uh, like in the in the early two thousands uh, in New Mexico. And so it's a family drama, which is very it's a risky type of movie to make because they don't make as much money as a genre movie like a horror or an action or a biopic. So that was a movie that uh, there was a lot of. Uh, you know, like, it was like a, as the really cheesy expression says, you know, labor of love, like it was all about <laughs> just kind of making the art, uh, having the director kind of it was very autobiographical for her. Um, and uh, Sasha Kaye is in it. Uh, and Leslie Grace and uh, Residente, uh, Kaye 13. He's the rapper in Puerto Rico, which was his first acting role. So it was very surprising. We basically shot it right before the strike last year uh, in the summer. Uh, and then we were really surprised it got into Sundance. Uh, Sundance Film Festival is a festival. It's kind of like the top American film festival. There's like Cannes, which is in France, Venice, which is in Italy, uh, and then Sundance, which is in uh, uh, in Utah, Park City. Uh, so that's where all like a lot of the big films go to premiere. Uh, and primarily, I would say like not studio movies, not like Star Wars or anything like that, but like it more uh, like indie or or some like yeah. studio movies that are a little bit smaller or whatever. So we got in, which was very shocking. Um, and then we went and, uh, you know, I had that other film there years ago, but I was just a co-producer. I helped find money. This one I actually produced like from the ground up. Um, and it which meant a lot because I'm a member of the Producers Guild. Uh, so that was cool. But and then we find out we won, which was really shocking. Uh, so that was really cool. Um, but yeah, then like right after, right after we won, uh, you know, I just kind of immediately went on to Ukrainians in Exile. So I don't know if you wanted to ask about that. That's kind of what I care most about, to be honest. Yeah, we, and we got just over three minutes now, too. And, and let's pivot over to Ukrainians in Exile, kind of how you got involved and, and why you're passionate about that project specifically. Yeah, so so I I, I, I shot it in 2022. I'm, do, I'm doing a charity campaign, so I'm definitely going to plug that while I'm here. Um, I... Uh, when the war broke out, uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine in February, late February of 2022, I got a ticket to go to Poland and then took a bus to the border in uh, early March, a few weeks later, to help refugees. And then I worked uh, with soldiers who were, I would basically pack tourniquets and medical equipment. Then they would bring it out to the front lines and to Kiev. And then luck, and then I brought a camera, right? I didn't really expect to shoot much, but what I did was I basically shot what I saw. I wanted to keep it very, I don't know, like William Wyler like, which is a doc filmmaker during World War II. I just wanted to show what I saw. I didn't want to bother the refugees, even though that makes me like a bad documentary filmmaker. I didn't do any interviews. I shot that. When I came back to America, I found a Ukrainian woman who is still in Ukraine, and I decided to make it about her perspective and how she felt about wondering if people would take care of refugees. I sat in the movie for a while. Uh, Steven Spielberg, cinematographer, cinematographer who did Schindler's List and Saber of Private Ryan, Janusz Kaminski, he put his name on it, uh, which helped the film. I sat on it because I feel like there was a lot of support for Ukraine and I felt like it would be better served once the support went away because people just stopped caring or they think Zelensky's a, I don't know, whatever whatever the hell people think. Uh, and and so now, because the uh, interest is waning, I use that to galvanize support for charities. And I worked with Liev Schreiber. Some people might know him. He was in Ray Donovan. Uh, he's in a bunch of movies. Like, I don't know. He's great. Uh, Goon Scream. Uh, great director, too. But he has a charity that's very boots on the ground. It helps. Uh, it vets NGOs and it gets money directly to people on the front lines. 
So I teamed up with him to release it in February 20, uh, on February 22nd, which was two days before the second anniversary of the invasion. And, uh, that's, and we've gotten a lot of like celebrities to like do outreach for it. Like Pat Oswalt, Peter Gabriel, the musician of third eye blind, uh, Bob Odenkirk, Lucy Liu, Sarah Silverman, uh, a bunch of people. And so people can check that out at the Nation magazine. That's the uh, distributor who released it, the the Nation. And uh, people can go to Blue Check Ukraine uh, and donate there. And feel free to, uh, to share the doc with anybody. If anybody's interested in helping Ukraine, um, it, it's, they need the help now much more than they did in February of 2022 when everybody was on board helping. So... Um, that's definitely a project that I probably care most about, even though it is a short doc. And, uh, you know, the whole purpose of it was was to penetrate the digital media landscape and to raise awareness and raise money for people who really uh, need it, especially uh, children on the front line. And the last question that I have for you, Yannick, and, and the minute that we have left today, can you just, you know, double reiterate where somebody could go to to watch uh, Ukrainians in Exile and any of the films that you produced? Is it is it on your website or is it Amazon? Kind of where where would they go to to watch? Yeah, you can. Well, uh, the the Ukrainians in Exile. You can go to uh, the Nation. You can go to uh, the Nation uh, the magazine, their website. Um, you can always just Google uh, my name um and so with like in the summers that's not out yet um for my other films you can just kind of go to i don't know i know younger people use letterbox which is cool um you can go check out that um you know you can yeah amazon for most of my films are on amazon prime uh okay. and some of the other ones we haven't mentioned on there are on there as well so yeah assemblylineentertainment.com is the website people can definitely check that out and then on in- instagram honestly has the most information uh, assembly line ent ent assembly line ent on Instagram, if you want to follow that. And usually we have all the news, where to watch stuff, links, to, you know, linking everything. And that's kind of the home base uh, for everything. Well, Yannick, thanks so much for sitting down with us today, you yeah. know, sharing your Sienna story, but more importantly, Ukrainians in exile and, and some of the other projects that you're working on. Uh, we're excited for you. Congratulations on the recognition. Hope to have you back on the show. Thanks everybody for listening. We'll see you next time right here on the Saints and Alumni Show. Have a great weekend.